uh, thank you, Pastor Kristen, for the opportunity to be able to share today. I want to um, I, I want to teach uh, on the subject topic of when leaders get lazy. When leaders get lazy, um, you know, I believe y'all all heard me at one point in time or another make the statement that if you can't do the little things now, you'll never have time for the little things later. And what I mean by that is, is little things in the, in, in the context of reading your Bible, praying, uh, serving, attending church. If you can't do those little things, which seem big, but in the scope of ministry, they're actually just a fraction. They're, they're a small part of what you do. Um, you know, I, recently I was discussing with someone and I made the statement, I said about 95% of what I do as the lead pastor does not involve a pulpit, right? And so in this day and age, everybody's motivated by a platform, a pulpit, and a microphone. And the reality of, of ministry, the reality of leadership, the reality of being a pastor, <coughs> excuse me, is 95% of all that you're going to do in the pastorate is not going to be found in the pulpit. Only about 5 to 10% of what you will do on a weekly basis uh, will be found within a pulpit, right? And so a lot of leaders, a lot of ministry leaders, a lot of people that, that find themselves in leadership roles, there's a great book that I read many years ago. I can't remember the author, but I would encourage you to look this book up. And the title of the book is Why Great Men Fall. Why Great Men Fall. It's a fantastic leadership book. It's not a theology Christian book. It's a, it, it, it is a secular uh, book, but it gives some really good insight that's applicable uh, to the leadership dynamic of ministry because it doesn't matter whether you're in ministry or whether you're in a secular uh, position. Leadership is going to be a burden of responsibility. Uh, if you desire to be in a leadership role. But a lot of leaders on the front end, they are very hard charging. They're very engaged, very involved, very, hey, we're going to make this happen, you know, full steam ahead. But for whatever reason, some leaders over a period of time, they get lazy. They start slacking. They start not doing the fundamental things that they need to do to stay sharp, they let their markets outpace uh, their function. You know, uh, you know the, the context of leadership is always striving to stay ahead of the curve. And once you get ahead of the curve, you just can't hit the autopilot button like it's an airplane and just expect it to, to, you know, to stay ahead of the curve. That's, that is where intentionality as a leader comes in. But a lot of times, Whenever leaders get lazy, leaders start making some really bad decisions. And there are three specific points in the Bible that I want to talk to you about today, about when leaders get lazy. And I'm going to show you the outcome of laziness from a biblical standpoint, but then I'm going to give you a modern uh, interpretation of that, right? And so, number one, <clears throat> lazy leaders are easily destroyed. Lazy leaders are easily destroyed. I, I'm loving seeing everybody looking down, making notes. I like that, right? A learner sees the value in a pencil, right? And so a, a lazy leader, lazy leaders, plural rather, are easily destroyed. Lazy leaders are easily destroyed. In Judges chapter 3, we're introduced to a couple of different interesting people, Othniel, but then we're introduced to a person by the name of Ehud. <coughs> I'm going to read <coughs> some of the passage of scripture here to you uh, to provide some context to what I'm talking about. So the Bible says in Judges 3 verse uh, 7, or excuse me, in verse uh, 12, it says, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites, and then he went and he defeated Israel. And they took possession of the city of Palms, and the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, for 18 years. So almost two decades. 
Verse 15, then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer by the name of Ehud, the, the son of Gera, a Benjaminite, a left-handed man. And the people of Israel sent tribute to him, by him rather, by Ehud, to Eglon, king of Moab. Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, which is about 18 inches. A cubit is about the span of a, the tip of a man's finger to his elbow. He had a, a, a two-edged sword about a cubit in length, and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. So he concealed the weapon, and he presented the tribute to King Eglon, uh, the, the king of Moab. And now Eglon was a very fat man. Uh, and whenever Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. So, so uh, uh, Ehud sent away everybody that, that came with him. But he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And, he, and the king commanded silence. And all of his attendants went out from his presence. And Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in the cool roof chamber. And he commanded, excuse me, and, and he who said, uh, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat. He who reached with his left hand from the sword on his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt also went in after the blade and the fat closed over the blade. For, for he did not pull out the sword from his belly and dung came out. Then Ehud went out from the porch, closed the door of the roof chamber behind him, and locked them. Whenever he had gone, the servants came, and when they saw that the door of the roof chamber was locked, they, they thought, well, surely he's relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. So, so they, they assumed he was going to the bathroom. And they waited until they were embarrassed. But when they still did not open the door of the roof chamber, they, they took the key and opened it, and there lay their Lord dead on the floor. So what's the point of, the, of, of me reading all of that? Well, the bottom line is this, is that lazy leaders are easily destroyed. This man's lack of motivation to be engaged in leading his nation led to a sedentary lifestyle. Now, obviously, this is a physical uh, dynamic that I'm talking about from a spiritual standpoint. It's very easy as a leader to get comfortable on your throne. It's very easy as a leader to get comfortable in your position of authority and get too comfortable. And the problem with that, with being too comfortable, is that it made him lazy. And whenever that, whenever, whenever this king, who two decades earlier, because if you remember at the beginning of this, it says that 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 um, that this king Eglon, king of Moab, rallied all of these other nations and tribes, and they went and they waged war against Israel. So obviously, Eglon had not always been huge, right? Uh, but but two decades later, he got too comfortable in his position of authority, and his laziness postured him in a place to be easily destroyed. And whenever leaders get lazy, lazy leaders become easily destroyed. And this man made a huge mistake, which quite literally cost him his life. Now, how can I apply that to a spiritual context? Once you find yourself in a role of ministry, of whatever capacity that that looks like, you're going to have to be diligent on your part. And there's nobody else who can do this for you. You have to own this yourself. You're not going to get this from the applause of people. You're not going to get this from strong church attendance. And you're not going to get this from budgetary needs being met. This is going to be something that you're going to have to own. And I want you to write on really big, O-W-N, all caps, underline, circle, italicized with a whole bunch of arrows pointing at it. You're going to have to own it because if you don't, you're going to get lazy. And whenever you get lazy, you're going to destroy yourself. You're going to put yourself in a position to where you're going to make a bad de decision that's going to cost you your position of ministry. It's going to cost you your position of leadership. You cannot get lazy. Say it with me. I cannot get lazy. Laziness 
is lack of intentionality. I'm gonna say that again. Laziness is a lack of intentionality. Everything about life and ministry, for example, you guys are all working towards your degree. That doesn't just happen. You have to be intentional about staying faithful with your classes so that you can accomplish the goal, which is to get your, your Bible college degree. Well, well, the same principle applies everywhere else. Success does not happen by happenstance. Success manifests due to the intentionality of doing things to make yourself successful. And so as a leader, you are not afforded the right to once you get in that role, just to say, well, I've arrived. I've made it, I've got a title now, I've got authority, I've got a position, so I can hit autopilot because I'm the man and I'm God's gift to everybody. Let me help you with something. If you listen to me, this is applicable in ministry and in the secular world. You are not that good and you are not fireproof. I'm just going to say it very, very forwardly. You are not that good and you are not fireproof. You, especially in ministry, you don't get a, a position of ministry just because you're good. God promotes based off of the anointing and not strictly the gifting. And the Bible says in the book of Proverbs that it's a man's gifts that make room for him before great men. However, I would like to add an addendum to that. Just because your gift makes room for you it's not your gifting that, that keeps you in the room. It is your character. It is your character. And so if you get lazy, if you get lazy, I'm telling you, I've, I've, I've been around this. I, I know. I know what I'm talking about. If you get lazy, you're going to start sacrificing character because you think that, that your gifting and your charisma makes up for your lack of character. That's not true. If you look at the teachings of the Apostle Paul, why do you think that Paul constantly talked about judging those who were in leadership? For example, Paul says, if a man comes unto you and claims to be an apostle, test the spirit of that man to see if he be of Christ. The, the principle there is, is that does the, does the fruit, right, match the title? Does his life live up to his position? Does his actions live up to his words? Because if they don't, he's a false apostle, right? There has to be fruit that comes with the position, not just gifting that makes room for oneself. And so again, your gifts will, as it were, as a key, unlock the door, but it's your character that keeps you in the room. But lazy leaders are easily de destroyed because notice, this was the problem of King Eglon. He thought because he had one big battle and conquered the nation of Israel, that he would always have victory over Israel. The problem was he underestimated Israel and their prayer life and their repentance, and God raised up a man to kill him because of his laziness. And so as leaders, you cannot get lazy because lazy leaders are easily destroyed. Point number two, lazy leaders are easily distracted. Lazy leaders are not only easily destroyed, lazy leaders are easily distracted. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, and I'm gonna turn here uh, in, my, in my Bible app. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, there's a very interesting scripture here in verse one of 2 Samuel chapter 11. Now, we all know the story of Bathsheba and David, right? Moral failure, sleep with his best friend's wife. You ain't got to watch the eight days of our lives to see drama. You just got to pick up your Bible and read, right? And so we all know that story, and we all know the end result of that. He sleeps with Bathsheba. She gets pregnant. He winds up bringing back her husband, tries to get him drunk to go home and sleep with his wife. That doesn't work. Uh, you know, he winds up citing the man's death warrant, sends him back into battle. They put him in the hottest spot of the warfare. He gets, winds up getting killed. And then David parades himself as being the hero, as marrying his best friend's wife because her, because her husband died valiantly fighting for the king. Now, we all know that story, but there's a problem here. And the problem 
is the genesis of why lazy leaders are easily distracted. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, the Bible says it this way. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites, and they besieged Rabbah, but notice this, but David remained at Jerusalem. But David remained at Jerusalem. I'm gonna read it again. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent out his leaders, but David remained at Jerusalem. David got lazy. David got too confident. David made the exact same mistake of King Eglon. He says, I've got victory. I'm the ruling party of this part of the world. I have the strongest standing army. God is with us. I'm going to send my mighty men out. I'm going to, I'm going to take a rest. I'm going to send them out to battle. I'm going to stay in Jerusalem. I'm going to stay home. Because if you no notice the verbiage here, when the time of the year came, notice this, that kings go out to war, David tarried in Jerusalem. David was anointed to fight bears and lions and giants and, and, and the Philistines and the Ammonites and the Amalekites and the Perizzites and all those ites, but the one battle that David was not anointed to fight was the battle he was gonna face on the terrace of his home looking at one of his mighty men's wives bathing on the roof of the house next door to his castle. He was anointed to fight and get victory in all these other areas, but notice the moment he got lazy and forfeited his responsibility to lead his men in the battle, he found himself facing a battle that he couldn't win. Lazy leaders are easily distracted. A leader who, who has his focus or, or his or her focus set to where it needs to be will not allow the distractions of the enemy to come in and cause them to forfeit their responsibility in leading the team that they are set to be head of. David got lazy and he fell into the exact same sin of King Eglon. He got comfortable in his victory. He felt that all was well and he didn't need to do those things anymore. Notice, because I'm the man now. Now, how do I make this applicable to us? Every one of you want to be in some form of ministry, right? I mean, I would hope so. For myself, whenever I came here to the assembly, whenever I was in the voting process, the hard part of my job was not preaching and getting voted on. That was the, the, the proverbial you know, shot from the pistol to send everybody on the race. That, that was not the end of the process. That was the beginning of the process. There are those who whenever opportunity is made available to them, they go into it, they, they push real hard for a little while, they, they, they get some good victories and some good progress, and then guess what? Autopilot. Hey, I'm good. My people love me. I don't have to push it you know, so hard anymore. Why don't I just take a little bit of a rest? Why don't I just slow down? If, have you, if any of this sound familiar to you? It, you know, I don't have to have that paper written this week. I'll just take a little bit of a rest. But then you're writing your paper at 2 a.m. the night before that the paper is due. Again, if, if you cannot implement being a strong leader now, then how do you intend to be a strong leader later? Because I'm gonna tell you something, the hardest person, listen to Pastor Chris, look into my eyes, look into my eyes, right? The hardest person that you will ever have to learn how to lead is yourself. Word, word, hallelujah, I ought to pass around an offering bucket. That is the truth, the hardest person that you will ever have to learn how to lead is yourself. So if you can't learn how to lead you now, 
If you can't learn how to keep you in line now, if you can't learn how to keep yourself, I, I know we don't like this word, but it's true. If you can't learn the value of you holding yourself accountable for the responsibilities that you have based upon your role and your title and your function within your organization, then how do you ever expect to be successful in the long run? Recently, there was a pastor friend of mine, Pastor Eddie Turner, out of the state of Tennessee. He's an Assembly of God pastor, been at one church for like 25 years, long, long, long time. I want to be that type of tenured pastor. I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and say something here. If you rotate churches like, like a baby rotates diapers, you will never, ever make it in ministry. This whole philosophy of going in and pastoring for two years and then church hopping to, to, to the next church, all that shows is that, you're, is that you are a flash in the pan and you have no sustainability in leadership. I'm not being ugly. I'm just being real, right? And so, but, but Pastor Eddie Turner made the statement. He said, um, I'm trying to remember the, the verbiage here, but, but the, the, the context of it was this. I want to finish well. I want to finish well. I want to finish well. You know, we obviously love that scripture where it says, he that began a good work in us shall see it to its completion, right? But we have a part in that completion part. It's not just going to miraculously happen. We have a part to play in that. And so for me, I don't want to just start well. I want to finish well. And David's fatal mistake was he fixed his ending based off of how he started, but his ending had no effort. He got lazy. He was like, you know what? I hate that. You know, I got this. I got mighty men. I've got, I've got leaders. I've got military. I've got all of these things, man. Hey, I'm going to hit the autopilot button and I'm going to cruise for a little while. And the moment he did that, he was faced with a battle that he was not anointed to win. And he messed up big time. So again, not only whenever leaders get lazy, are they easily de destroyed? Whenever a leader gets lazy, you were easily distracted. You know, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs that it is the little foxes that spoil the vine. We think that it's going to be the huge things that destroy our ministry, you know, um, some type of mega moral failure. But a lot of times, the outcome of those major moral failures is due to years of laziness. Not praying, not maintaining boundaries, not holding oneself accountable, not staying in the word, not praying in the Holy Ghost, not living out a lifestyle of holiness, not maintaining personal responsibility, not leading well, leaning on everybody else to do our job for us, and then us bear the title, and, if, and, and then if everything goes bad, that we yell and scream and holler and get mad at everybody else whenever at the end of the day it was your fault that it failed. We don't want to own that, but it's true. And so again, whenever, whenever leaders get lazy, we get easily distracted, and that's what crippled David. So not only have we seen what laziness does in a pagan king, King Eglon, we also see what it does to a godly king in King David. But then lastly, I want to talk about this. In First, uh, first Kings 15, let me switch over here real quick. First Kings 15, let me get this open. <clears throat> now this is very important. Whenever leaders get lazy, lazy leaders are easily deterred. Deterred, D-E-T-E-R-R-E-D, -E -E deterred. This is what I mean by that. In 1 Kings chapter 15 and verse 9, we're introduced to a king by the name of Asa who, follow, who follows his father, uh, uh, Abijam. Now, Abijam didn't live right. Jer you know, Jeroboam wasn't doing right. Abijam slept with his, uh, uh, you know, Abijam, uh, Abijam winds up dying, and then they bury him, and then Asa, his son, uh, takes his place as king. I'm going to read something to you here, so I want you to hang out with me for just a second. In the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Asa began to rule over Judah, and he reigned for 41 years in Jerusalem, so for over four decades. His mother's name was Makkah, the daughter of Abishalom, and Asa 
didn't notice this. And Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord as David, his father, has done. So, so that's a good thing, right? I mean, he, you know, he's not being lazy. I mean, he's, you know, he's wanting to do things right. <clears throat> he put away the male cult prostitutes out of the land, and he removed all of the idols that his fathers had made. He also removed Martha, his mother, from being a queen mother because she had made an abominable image of Ishara. And Asa cut down her image and burned it at the brook of the, uh, at the brook Kidron. Notice this. So he, he's doing all these good things. He's putting male, uh, you know, the male prostitute cults out of the country, driving them out of the land. He removes all the idols of his father. He addresses the abominations of, of what his mother uh, has done. But there's a problem in verse 14. It says, but the high places were not taken away. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was wholly true to the Lord all of his days and he brought into the house of the Lord the sacred gifts of his father and his own sacred gifts of silver and gold and of vessels. So what's my point here? Lazy leaders are easily deterred because lazy leaders are not up for the fight. And leadership is a fight. And I don't mean bullets and guns and drawing swords. I mean leadership in the sense of pushing forward culture. Lazy leaders are easily deterred. Notice, notice this, that he was all for driving out the male prostitutes. He was all for driving out cults. He was all for driving out the idolatry of his father and even addressing his mother. But he refused to address the high places. Now, why is that important? Because all through 1 Kings, all of these different kings rise to power. None of them address the high places. They would re remove, notice this, they would remove everything that was at eye level that people dealt with on a daily basis. But they, re but they refused to address the big things in the high places. This man allowed whatever to deter him because he got lazy. He got too comfortable. Notice this. He got too confident in his victories. And he says, I've pushed it far enough. I drove out the male prostitutes. I drove out the cults. I drove out idolatry. And I dealt with my mama. I think I've dealt with enough. I'm going to rule well. I don't want any more controversy. I don't want any more problems. I'm just going to sit down right here. I'm not too much worried about those high places. People are going to do what they're going to do. It's all right. You just focus on doing you. The problem is, as a leader, you're not afforded that right. And Asa got lazy, and because he was a lazy leader, Lazy leaders are easily deterred from addressing all of the problem. Say all. You need to write all. A-L-L, all cap, circle with arrows pointing to it. Many of you think, well, hey, I'm doing good. I, I don't have this sin in my life. I don't have that problem in my life. And just like Asa, we address the big things that everybody talks about, but we don't want to address the high places in our lives. For example, we don't want to address a relationship that we know we don't need to be in. Now, I don't necessarily mean that from a standpoint of, a, of an intimate relationship. I mean that in the context of any relationship. Here's a way that you can balance that. If the person is conducive to your vision as a leader five years from now, then the relationship is worth investment. If they are not going to be a part of helping you to accomplish your vision that God has put in your life five years from now, you need to cut the relationship off. Well, pastor, that, that's a hard statement, but it's true. So which do you want? Do, do, do you want the discomfort of dealing with a relationship that you don't need? versus the responsibility that you have to God being called unto his ministry. Which are you going to do? And which is more important, the call of God on your life or a relationship? Again, 
weigh it in the balances of leadership because where you're going is going to be determined by two things, the call of God on your life and who you surround yourself with. And if you surround yourself with turkeys, you're going to start walking like a turkey and gobbling like a turkey and eating like a turkey and nesting like a turkey and doing all the things that a turkey does. But here you are as an eagle and you're refusing to step into your God-given identity because you're more concerned about what people are gonna think about you as a leader than your responsibilities as a leader. That'll preach. And so, again, three things. Lazy leaders are easily destroyed. If, if, well, well, pastor, I'm just a procrastinator. Well, then you're never gonna make it in ministry. I know that's very forward. I know that's very blunt, but I'm just being very honest with you. You will never grow in ministry if you are a procrastinator. It doesn't work that way. If you don't learn how to, again, lead yourself now, then how are you going to be strong enough to lead people later? Because here's the thing. You can fool some of the people some of the time. I think it was Abraham Lincoln that, 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 that said this. He said, you can fool some of the people some of the time but you can't fool all the people all the time. The reality is that people that, that work with you, serve with you and lead with you are eventually going to see the truth about you. And if they find out that you're a procrastinator and you're lazy and you're not handling your job, strong leaders are not gonna follow a weak leader. They're just not. Strong leaders follow a strong leader. And they're going to have to see that you take your role very serious and that you mean business, right? Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have fun and that you don't let, let your personality shine through and, and, be, and be fake. That's not what I'm talking about. But at the end of the day, you don't ever need the mistake of casting off the weight of, of your responsibility because you want to be liberated. Guys, Paul said it best. He said, I am a bond servant unto Christ. I am a slave unto Christ, which means that we all forfeit our will for his will whenever we chose to accept the call of God that is on our life. And lazy leaders, lazy leaders do not build strong kingdoms. They don't. And so Jesus is looking for some strong leaders who are not going to be easily destroyed, who, who are not going to be easily distracted, and who are not going to be easily deterred. 